Good morning, Lyle. Hello again. How was your weekend? Oh, good. We, uh, oh, we went skiing uh, yesterday morning, and I and I finished uh, editing. Um, well, all of what I've written so far on on the quantum field theory book. Uh, so I've been I've been burning on that. Um, but yeah, I really, you know, the, the rest of it um, is just in the notes from a previous version of the class um, that uh, are just blackboard pictures and audio files. And so somehow all of that's gotta be transcribed into, into um, licks, into LaTeX. So that's a that's a different kind of chore to, to do that. Hey, can I ask you a question? Yeah, um, sure, of course. It's on that uh, that problem that we were supposed to turn in last week that I haven't turned in yet. Um, oh, that one. Yes. But I've I've been I'm, I'm up to eight pages. I mean, I've been working on it, um, but okay. I keep running into little issues here and there that. Um, oh shit! Uh, hang hang yeah, on. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's we, okay. We, okay. We, uh, I got it. We had a little crash over here. Uh, hey, Kevin. Hi, that's hey, really. Give me just a second. I had a minor cappuccino disaster. Oh, shoot. That sounds like a major cappuccino disaster if it's a disaster. Yeah, it was kind of major. <laughs> oh. I got it. Lucky. Yeah, all right. Well, Meg's, Meg's dealing with that. Okay, uh, let's see. Sorry. Uh, back on the problem. Yeah, the, so. Do you complex have your, field, right? Do you have hey, the uh, textbook open, uh, by chance? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to point at something. Um, okay. So it's on page. Uh, it's page one thirty one. Okay, I'm scrolling back here. And we have the the Poisson brackets after we've um, uh, quantized the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Brackets. Now we've done. done yeah, sun brackets. Now yeah. we've gone to the commutators. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I ended up getting the order switched on psi and pi from what you have in the book. Basically, basically I have a negative sign for what you have written there. Okay. Uh, and I don't, but I don't I've, have any I've, inconsistency. I've written it backwards. You're right. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. I, uh, I've, I've tried to replace everything with the, the field first and the momentum second. All right, so that's that's the way I want to write the commutators. So I've got it backwards. Okay, good. That makes um, me feel a lot better. In in those notes. So, yeah, um, yeah. Let's let's see. This is chapter four problem. I'll I'll change it right now. By the way, I just posted a new. Oh yeah, I never modified those. Jeez, how did I do that? All right, that's that's a thing to fix. I'll, I'll, I'll get that fixed. I did just post the current version of the book, which is almost everything except for the mistakes that you guys find. Um, hey, everybody. Hey, Guillermo. Uh, yeah, Paige. Okay, yeah. Thanks for the note. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, Guillermo, uh, Lyle found that uh, the commutator is 4.18, 4.19, it looks like. Uh, I I wrote pi phi instead of phi pi for the for the commutation relations, and I, I realize now those equations are numbered because I didn't edit them for some reason. I just copied them, so uh, so that throws things off by a sign. Uh, you know, this is um, <laughs> chasing down signs like this is what it's all about. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of that. Um, I've just been struggling with. Uh, E and M using an unfamiliar metric and you know raising and lowering and uh, a spatial index introduces a sign and flipping the uh, Faraday tensor introduces a sign. Have you guys, by the way, all seen E and M in relativistic notation? Is that you're you're good on that? Okay, good. Um, yeah. All right. So um, yeah, because I I just use that freely. All right. Uh, are there other questions before launching into the Dirac field? Was that a question? 
I, I saw uh, okay uh that was launching launching all right oh okay <laughs> here we go yeah my, my cappuccino got launched onto the floor over there it's, uh, yeah very sorry for your loss oh yeah yeah if if everything suddenly goes uh it got into the plugs uh, and shorted out everything um Oh, no, the, the greatest despair is not the cappuccino, but the, the mug. It was a nice mug. Oh, no, we can get another I, one. Oh, we can get another. Good. The red ones, they're very just cool. Just like it. Just like it. <laughs> okay. We can get one just like it. So life is good. Yay, eBay. <laughs> yeah. Let's hear it for eBay. Okay. So pick a color, guys. I got red, <laughs> black, blue, green. What do you like today? No preference. All right. Uh, let's go let's, black. Black. You know what black does to the floor? You know, this, this <laughs> leaves such, such crap. It's because it All shows right, up I will so do black. Well. It shows up better. I get it. You know, we'll, we'll deal with the floor. So. You don't have like a little lip on the bottom of the board? Yeah. Uh, oh, I, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that catches some of it. It's like, uh, oh, it's an awful mess down there. The, the spilled cappuccino only makes it cleaner. <laughs> it's, it's, it's time to, uh, wait, here comes Eli. Okay. Eli, hello. Hi. Okay. So, uh, the Dirac equation, uh, the Dirac action is the integral and we don't need any halves on this one. We need a D4X. Oh yeah. That does show up nicely, doesn't it? And it's side bar I D slash minus M side. Okay, and I think we've already talked about what what the bar means. Um, if I were to put indices on these spinners, uh, when I do, I use an uppercase Latin index. So I would write this as uh, side A dagger with a spinner metric. Um, whose components are actually the same as gamma zero. And then uh, here we have I gamma mu as components B, uh, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, yeah. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. Oh, yeah. So derivatives, then minus M, I better use delta B C. I see. So you get used to the idea that we're living in multiple spaces here, two or three different spaces. Um, when we start using, uh, you know, if we have several of these direct fields uh, connected by an SU2, say, there's going to be another SU2 index on everything. So we uh, uh, suppress the ones that we're not working with currently. Um, lots easier to write this than to write all this out, but this is really the object we're looking at. We're dealing at the same time with some diff a, a differential equation, but there's also a matrix equation going on here. So to solve this, we're going to need to work with both of these. We can also uh, integrate that derivative by parts, and that introduces a sign, e4x, and then, then the derivative is acting on psi bar. Uh, wait, and you get a minus sign here, and the derivative acts to the left. And so we can write it that way. Uh, and then, if you vary psi in that second equation, you get the conjugate Dirac equation, which is equivalent to the first one. This action is real. Um, now, we ran through the reality of this action, and uh, I suddenly went through and erased the I, and you guys gave me a lot of flack for that, and you were right to. It was, it was, it's real with the I, so maybe we should check that. Um, what, uh, what happens if we look at the conjugate? So let's, uh, let's look at S conjugate before next. Now let's see, we have to reverse everything here. So uh, 
we're going to have this psi dagger. Um, then let's see. Uh, I this D is acting that way. Um, slash dagger uh, minus M. Um, oh boy. No, this is this is. I, I better put indices to see what I'm doing. So dagger A. Then the, the first term here, uh, we're going to have a, a minus I I and pull that out. Then we're going to have gamma mu dagger. And then these derivatives are acting on that one, which gets flipped to the front. So this is D mu psi uh, dagger. And I'm gonna I'm gonna try to avoid using the um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to avoid using all the spinner indices. I think I can get away with it. And then uh, so this is psi dagger h is going to become h dagger psi, and then the m term uh, will have this psi dagger, and then uh, the h dagger and this becomes psi. So it looks like that uh, with an m. So those two terms. Now what happens here? Um, this is Hermitian. Uh, these gamma mu, uh, gamma mu dagger, here's, here's the reason people often will write this as a gamma zero. Right. If you think that this is gamma mu dagger gamma zero, um, that that breaks into two things, and it's it's true whichever way we write this. But uh, for for the spatial coordinates, the dagger um, they're anti Hermitian, and we get uh, minus gamma i gamma zero. If that's a zero, it's Hermitian, and we just get gamma zero gamma zero. Well, also in the spatial case, you're going to have to reverse these to get back to the original thing. That's going to get rid of that sign. But here, you don't have to reverse it. it well, it's the same either way. It's just gamma zero, gamma zero. So we can we can write this as uh, let's write it all this way as gamma zero, gamma mu. Oh, so, thank you. Cappuccino largely recovered. Prost. Same mug, too. Yeah. Oh, same mug. See, nice mug, huh? OK. Um, you guys with me here? All right. So uh, so commuting, uh, and this, this is the property that's really useful here, is that uh, gamma mu dagger h is the same as h gamma mu. So in passing the gamma mu, the, the metric um, undaggers it. So now we have B4x and then uh, still minus I D mu psi dagger uh, H gamma mu psi minus M psi dagger H psi because H is information here. And this is where we got to last time. And I thought, oh, this, this sign is bad. But no, what we forgot is to integrate by parts again because we want the derivative back over there. And so when we integrate by parts to move the derivative onto psi instead of psi dagger, uh, now we get um, I psi dagger H gamma mu d mu psi minus M psi dagger H psi which is yes which is out of frame yeah. which is what out of frame there you go yeah yeah sorry um yeah so uh so s is real um and it does it does have the i in there so i i think the thing i was forgetting to do last time we looked at this was to uh to do that last integration by parts so uh any questions on this 
Now, what do we do? Uh, we, we have a representation for the gamma matrices. Uh, in fact, you never need one. These are two by two identities. Uh, gamma i, we can write as this. It's, it's a convenience to, to choose a particular form for the gamma matrices. But all of the properties of everything that we're working out here follow just from the Clifford algebra relationship, the, the anti-commutator of the gammas giving the metric times two. So everything actually follows from gamma alpha, gamma beta is twice eta alpha beta. This is, this is all that actually ever comes into it. So we can find the conjugate momentum. You know, we're gonna just work through the whole Hamiltonian formulation here. Any, any question on this? Uh, good, right? Eli said no, so if you have questions, ask Eli. <laughs> Eli, you and I should meet sometime. I don't know if you had had to look at everything. I, I, Hear from people that yeah, focusing can be a little hard uh, these days. You know, I, geez, I was emailing with Noah over the weekend and trying to schedule a Zoom, and yeah, uh, you know, after Wednesday, you know, my classes are done Wednesday. Between Wednesday and Monday, I lose track of the day completely. You know, it's like like you know, so I I was scheduling a Zoom for Monday and thought it was for Sunday and overlapping another, and it wasn't. It was fine. Okay, so we want to vary the Lagrangian with respect to psi. And what that's going to do is not hard to see. So the, uh, or sorry, uh, d mu d, d zero psi. And uh, that's going to be the conjugate momentum. But what happens then, uh, it, you have to look at the zero component. Here's here's the derivative. So we have psi bar uh, i. We have a gamma zero d zero psi. So we're taking a functional derivative with respect to this. It's going to give a Dirac delta that will then integrate to give us i psi bar gamma zero as the conjugate momentum, and that's what I've got here too. And of course, that's actually a whole bunch of stuff hidden in there. It's psi dagger a h a b uh, gamma zero b c. So the net effect is a, a down index here, and um, nobody ever bothers to write all those indices. But uh, if you need to, you can. You know, it's it's a nice way to check results. So so this actually is a I sub C here um, as the, the free index. Uh, now, we can write this in several different ways. Uh, basically, uh, this is uh, a, an identity, but the index is down. So I could think of this as just I psi dagger with an index down. Where, where the thing that's lowered it is this combination. These are actually the same matrix, but they're, they're different, different kinds of tensor. Okay, now, why is that? Uh, sorry, what was the question? Why, why can you treat it as an, ident an identity? Uh, all right, we're, we're working in a basis. We're, we're not gonna change this basis. And in this basis, H, this is zero two tensor one one minus one minus one and gamma zero a b is one one minus one minus one it's a one one tensor but they're the same they're the same matrix so their product is just the identity matrix which i can write this way um, and as long as we don't change to a different basis for our gamma matrices that's fine you know we can pretty much use H and gamma zero interchangeably. Um, it's, it's abusive notation, right? But it does simplify a lot of expressions to just 
write gamma zero when you're really talking about H. So there are, there are various ways we can write this. We could, uh, if I put a gamma zero on here, I can write, uh, let me see which way this goes. Um, yeah, pi, pi times gamma zero is uh, I psi bar. Okay, well, that's cheating too, because this is really an H. But uh, if I look up here, it's exactly right. Um, so pi times gamma zero, that gamma zero squares to one. So it, uh, so pi times gamma zero really is I psi bar. So that's, that's true without, uh, without finessing the, the um, notation. Okay, so now, um, anybody notice anything odd about that, uh, uh, about this conjugate momentum? Say that guy right there, I have side bar again, zero. There's no derivative. All right, that momentum has no derivative in it. Usually it's something like psi dot, but not here. And uh, you just press on nonetheless. I mean, it's got an infinitesimal derivative in it. You know, the, this gamma matrix here is that not giving us perhaps the infinitesimal version? No, that's, that's a whole different space, in fact. Yeah, the gamma zero is living in some complex four space. The derivative is a derivative in space time. Now, you know, you're, you're not wrong when you say that. Uh, it turns out there are some very odd behaviors of, of spin. When you do supersymmetry, right, you introduce some transformations that mix different spins. And if you, uh, if you do a, a transformation of say a spin half field, you can get a spin one field. Um, it adds a little bit of, you, you, you have to do the, the parameter for the transformation is an anti-commuting thing, in fact. So, so that uh, even though the spinner's anti-commute, that anti-commuting parameter times your original spinner becomes a, a bosonic quantity and you can add that to the bosonic field. So you're, you're doing something like, you know, the variation of some spinner thing is going to be some, uh, you know, the, the change in your, in some vector field is, is going to be um, a, an anti-commuting parameter times, uh, you know, some, some small piece of your spinner field. So, so the vector changes by some spinner stuff. There's probably a gamma mu sitting in here or something. But the, the point I was making is that if you do this twice, there's this anti-commutation relationship uh, between the spin generators, uh, a spin generator and its conjugate uh, looks like this. And it, it turns out that this is something like uh, a poly matrix um, where the zeroth poly matrix is just the identity uh, acting on the momentum generator, but the momentum generator is actually a, an infinitesimal translation. So in effect, if you do, if you do a supersymmetry transformation and then follow it by a second supersymmetry transformation to come back to the original spinner field, it actually is displaced slightly. You actually, they, they differ by an infinitesimal translation. So in a sense, what you're saying is, uh, is a property of, um, uh, of these spinner fields that some kinds of transformation uh, of the spinner character um, relates to displacements. Now, this is only in supersymmetry. That's not here in what we're doing today. Uh, but, you know, there, there is such a relation. So you're, you're, not, you're not wrong to relate those. Um, this is much more general because, I mean, it yeah. looks a little bit like a wave equation type thing without a derivative. 
Um, yeah. But maybe it's just a much more general version of that. Where it well, have the derivative. okay, so here it, it really just has no derivative in it. It's just a matrix. A matrix the times the, uh, the conjugate spinner gives you the conjugate momentum to the spinner. So you know, that's literally what is happening here. Um, the conjugate momentum to psi is conjugate psi times some matrix. And uh, there's nothing a priori wrong with that. We just have to deal with it and see what happens. You're going to see this board becoming more and more smeary as we go. So the Hamiltonian, right? We sum over the uh, conjugate momentum times the time derivative of the field. And I want to get my indices right here. And I hope you'll forgive me for continually going back and forth to my notes on this, but this um, <laughs> direct fields get complicated. So hang in there with me. Um, then we're going to subtract the uh, Lagrangian, which we can write as the integral of the Lagrange density, is going to be psi bar i d slash minus m psi. And so we have to figure out what this thing is. Well, the um, it's really sort of weird because uh, I psi bar gamma zero, this is I psi bar gamma zero, D zero psi. So everything becomes D three X. This minus um, I psi bar um, D slash psi uh, plus M psi bar psi. Okay. This is sort of weird because this has just the same form as this. This is actually minus I psi bar gamma zero D zero psi, which cancels. Uh, and then we have minus I psi bar gamma I times the spatial derivatives. So the time derivatives totally cancel out of the Hamiltonian and we're left with D3X. And then uh, some, some signs, if I've got this right. Uh, yeah, all right. So minus, um, I psi bar is this, let me see how I'm writing this. Huh. Um, oh yeah, all right. So we, we had this identity. Um, Pi gamma zero was the same as uh, a psi bar. I lost it here. Um, no. The same as I psi bar. So that means that this I psi bar I can write as pi gamma zero. So you have minus pi gamma zero. Um, or rather, sorry, this one, gamma i di psi plus m psi bar psi as, as the Hamiltonian. And I think I might have gotten that right. Uh, did I lose an i? No, the i, the i went into the pi. So yeah, this looks right. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty weird Hamiltonian. Um, we have written it in terms of pi. Uh, that's good. Yeah, there, there's, there's no other pi sitting around here unless, uh, I suppose we could write that as an i pi. Yeah, that's a good question, do we? I haven't here, but it looks like we could. Now, if we use the equation of motion, right, so, Remember, I d slash minus m psi um, equals zero. And I can write this as I gamma zero d zero psi um, plus I gamma i d i psi 
uh, minus m psi. And this part is sitting right here. So I could actually, if I use uh, with the equation of motion, uh, I could write H as simply D3X, and then uh, it becomes, let's see, pi gamma zero, the gamma zero squares. So I think it's just I pi D zero psi. All right, just uh, so we have this pi gamma zero, but um, that it's this gamma zero and squares to one. And yeah, that's um, no i. The, the i is in the pi. Okay, so so you can actually write this with a Hamiltonian with a with a time derivative, but you've used the equation of motion, so you can't use that to derive Hamilton's equations and expect to get the field equation back. In fact, I do that in the notes, and you just get an identity. So it doesn't give anything new. Mm. It doesn't. It doesn't let you reproduce the field equation. You've already assumed the field equation to write it that way. But it does give a little bit of comfort that you actually can write the Hamiltonian uh, in a way that involves a time derivative somehow. Um, so we can get the Dirac equations, and uh, if we. Um, just look at the Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. So let's see. Uh, yeah, here's here's the Hamiltonian. Yes, question. Yeah, can we see the bottom of the board one more time? Oh yeah, sure. And uh, let me let me rewrite the Hamiltonian up here so we have it handy. So the Hamiltonian is now e three x, and then. Uh, Minus pi gamma zero gamma i times uh, psi plus m psi bar psi. So now we we want d zero of psi to be given by the Poisson functional Poisson bracket of psi with h. Um, so, okay, you erase stream if not. Um, leave that bottom in case you're still writing, but. Uh, so we're just uh, varying one field, right? Or are we just like assuming one field? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We only we only work with psi and pi. Um, yeah, not the conjugate, um, which is a little strange. Uh, yeah, I worried about that too, and tried it any uh, of a number of other ways. But you can you can either work with psi pi or psi conjugate and pi conjugate, but you don't work with both here. Yeah, would that be would that be perhaps a left-handed versus right-handed perspective or something? Well, it might be. I mean, yeah, uh, right derivative and left derivative and the matrix is acting on this side of that. So yeah, yeah. The, basically your Dirac operator is um, acting one way or the other. Dr. Wheeler, did you miss a uh, partial derivative? Um, when you rewrote the Hamiltonian just then, acting on psi, the first psi? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Di yeah. psi. That's right. So, okay, if we want the functional derivative here, uh, so what happens, um, we're going to get, okay, here we're going to get the derivative of the functional derivative of di psi with respect to uh, psi um, as part of this. Let, I, maybe I should write this out. Uh, this is d psi of, let's say, if this is psi of x, um, then we have a variation with respect to psi of y. Then 
variation of Hamiltonian with respect to pi of y summed over uh, y minus the other way around. So minus del psi of x del pi of y del h del uh, psi of y. And now the, these are independent. Psi and pi are your independent coordinates, if you like. And so that goes away. This is going to give del three of x minus y like that. So we really need del h del pi uh, to compute what goes on here. And then we're going to integrate over the delta function. So del h del pi is just this stuff. So minus pi gamma zero gamma i partial, oh, sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Um, let's see. No, this is right. Delta, no, I, I had that right. So, and this is going to be dependent on x after we integrate over the direct delta gamma zero, gamma i, di, psi. And um, that's psi dot. Well, okay, that, that actually works because if I multiply it by gamma zero, see I have gamma zero psi is, um, oh no, we can't get rid of that. No, not, not so easy. We'll, we'll get back to that. Um, minus gamma zero. Oh, I see the problem. No, pi, right? We, we varied with respect to pi, pi is gone. So, so we just get this. And that is, uh, let's see, let's do pi. Question, now I'm wondering whether I should have written this as a pi, because I can write this as, um, let's see, minus m times i, then I have an i gamma bar, but that's pi gamma zero, I think. Is that right? <laughs> I lost the identity. Um, so if I vary pi in that, uh, I'm gonna have minus, I am um, gamma zero psi. Oh, that looks pretty close. Um, I'm worried about the sign. But uh, if, if I hit this with gamma zero, I have gamma zero d zero psi here, bring this to the other side, but gamma zero squares to one, so I have gamma i partial i. Um, on psi, um, let's see, bring this to the other side, I have plus I M psi equals zero. And now um, multiply by I, this is I D slash psi minus M psi equals zero. So already I've recovered the Dirac equation just from that variation. Whew, that's pretty cool. I think the pi zero does it too. I don't know why I get this. Yeah, uh, funny things happen anytime you're working with the Dirac equation. It's, uh, it's always a little bit mysterious and yet somehow manages to work out. So um, <clears throat> let's look at the other Hamilton equation. We look at d zero pi. And now what we need is, right, uh, d psi d um, pi is zero. So it's this term that's going to survive. We're going to have d pi d pi. So um, and this minus sign, remember this is given by minus the derivative of h. So the two minus signs cancel. And we're left with the integral d3x of del h del, and this is pi psi of uh, 
Y. We're integrated with Y here. And we have uh, from d pi d pi, we have a del three of X minus Y. Okay, so now that functional derivative is going to give, all right, now with respect to psi, we're gonna, we're gonna get a delta function here, which we integrate by parts and get a plus. So we're gonna have pi, uh, sorry, d, di of pi, gamma zero, gamma i, um, and then the delta function. And then the M term, which we wrote this way, we're varying psi. So we're gonna have minus I M pi gamma zero. Um, uh, sorry, all of it is del three X minus Y. So we do the integral and <clears throat> let's see, uh, this pi, I keep erasing this, but what is it? Pi gamma zero is I psi bar. Is, is that the identity? Sorry to keep forgetting this, but uh, pi gamma zero is I psi bar. Yeah, so let's, let's not lose that this time. So I can write this as um, I partial I of um, psi bar, then we have gamma zero, gamma i, uh, minus i, right, becomes a plus, right? So if I'm replacing pi with psi bar, I'm gonna have plus m psi bar gamma zero um, is d zero times i psi bar. And I'm thinking that what this is gonna do is give me the, the conjugate Dirac equation. Um, if I, uh, I, I multiply on the right by a gamma zero, uh, let's see, yeah, so I have I D zero psi bar gamma zero. Um, right, this term, gamma zero anti-commutes with gamma I. So if I anti-commute those, I, it's gonna square to one, but I've picked up a minus sign. So bringing this to the other side, I get plus I di psi bar gamma I, the gamma zeros have gone away. And then minus M um, psi bar, and I multiplied by the gamma zeros, so that's gone. Uh, all of that equals zero. And this is now, um, Let's see, did I get a sign wrong? This, this, this looks like I d mu psi bar uh, gamma mu minus m psi bar um, equals zero. So uh, I'm, I'm missing a sign. Uh, does anybody see where I've lost a sign? Yeah, I think it was when you first did uh, pi dot, the very first line, shouldn't that be a minus? Yeah, uh, pi dot here? Inside the integral, yeah. All right, that would help. So let's see, that changes both of those. So the M's right, but then here, um, now that's becoming a minus. So I, I don't have the, the full sum here. Now the, the sign needs to be, let's see, it seems, see, I, I think I got two signs here uh, because in the, in the Poisson bracket, I'm taking del pi del pi with this minus sign, del h uh, del psi. But I also, oh, you're right. There is a sign there. Um, yeah, that sign survives. I was, I was thinking, um, I was thinking I was writing Hamilton's equation, but I'm writing the Poisson bracket, so I don't need another sign. 
so there is an overall sign outside of this. So that's part of what I need. Um, then uh, that this is going to become plus uh, when when I oh no it's not it's not plus yet sorry here so now when I when I multiply by gamma zero I get this this is the term where I need a minus sign um, still because okay gamma zero here is um, Going to, going to make this a plus because gamma zero, gamma i, gamma zero is just gamma i, it's, it's minus gamma i. So that sign is going to go away and I'm, I'm going to have plus this on the right minus that, but I'm still getting minus this term. So why do I have, why do I have that? Um, pi gamma zero. So the pi dt I'm writing as, um, uh, let's see, up. Oh, so pi I can write as i psi bar gamma zero from here. Um, so d zero of that should be i d zero psi bar gamma zero. And then I'm multiplying by another gamma zero. Let's see where the sign comes from. I'm still missing a sign on that time part. Uh, well, let me see what my notes say, if I have anything different there. D zero pi. So I have minus, yeah, I have this as D zero pi. And pi is I psi bar gamma zero. Okay, that's all the same. So then what? Are we, are we integrating over y, which is the other term in the direct delta, like a minus y? Uh, well, yeah, the, this delta comes from a um, functional derivative of pi x with respect to pi y. So that's, that's just a straight up direct delta. So then since we're, since we're integrating with respect to y as opposed to x, won't we pick up a minus sign? Because we're- uh, del delta, delta is symmetric in x and y. So, so no, I, I don't think that's it. Um, and yeah, I'm showing the same thing, but why, why do I have? Is it the M? Which part are you, are you, uh, are we? Um... Um, oh, no, it's, I think it's okay. What's no, the problem? So this is plus. When I bring this to the other side, it gets a minus. So I have a minus here and that is the conjugate Dirac equation. Ha! Huh. All right, so we have minus I psi bar D slash acting left, all of that minus M psi bar equals zero. That's it. Yeah, we got it. We just, uh, it wasn't wrong. So, uh, welcome to the Dirac equation. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's see, I'll try to, uh, no, I'm, let's see, I'm definitely in the way if I stand there, right? Okay, I'll try to keep that visible to you while I, okay, so, uh, and okay, so I give you some exercises where you can play with this all yourselves. And um, you can see it's non-trivial to learn how to manipulate these things, so do them. Mm. I uh, I do I do want to see your problem one uh, emailed to me. Has anybody emailed me one yet? Uh, yeah, good. Okay, Alex, good, got it. Yes, you did. Um, so Alex passes. Everybody else fails. <laughs> I promise. I, I, I'm almost there. I, I feel I feel like you guys are working on this, right? So um, you know if it. If it takes you like 20 pages to work this out, you know, I think the first time I did this, it took that long too. So, you know, it's it's long to work through these and we're gonna be working through more of them. So, you know, get, get those, uh, uh, you know, 
get those kinds of calculations down. Um, you know, it's it'll be nice if we can, uh, you know, actually abbreviate them a little bit. I do abbreviate them in the notes down to you know a, a few steps. So what you get, you've you've got this Fourier transform. Uh, you're going to take a product of two of them. You, you've got nine integrals. You've got a d3x that's going to give you a Dirac delta, and then a d3 three Q that's going to integrate over that direct Delta and set all the Q's to plus or minus K. And you're going to end up with some kind of a series D three K um, that uh, yeah, depending what you're computing may or may not have a Delta, but um, it, you can, uh, it, you can do a couple of those steps in your head once you've done enough of them to, to see what you're doing. Don't rush it. Uh, best to write it all out the first few times you do this, but uh, it will get faster. So, all right, let's solve the classical Dirac equation. Uh, what we want to do is, it, it's a complex field, so we're going to have different mode amplitudes. The other thing is, as I pointed out before, we're working in two spaces at once here. So uh, the Dirac equation is both a matrix equation and a differential equation. But the, the usual trick works. We're going to write our solution as a Fourier series. And so to start that, what we do is we write a single Fourier mode and see what happens with that. So. I'm going to let psi of x and t be some, uh, some function of momentum uh, times a uh, e to the minus i p alpha x alpha. And then a conjugate thing, b star of p alpha e to the i the alpha x alpha the the two the two different Fourier oscillating guys uh, yeah plus I got the signs right here um, now uh, what are you and v here that's the question to ask because we're trying to solve i d slash minus m psi equals zero that's our equation of motion well this d is going to hit the the exponential oscillations and pull down some p's. That's fine. What are u and v? What kind of objects are they? And I've written, uh, there's one mistake I've written in expanding that. Uh, I think, let's see, is it? Yes, uh, yeah, probably. This, this is a spinner. Those are just functions. So these guys have to be spinners. So really that's that's a vector. So I'm gonna write it as a dagger here. And uh, I'm not sure that's the best thing to do. Now, I, I still wanna think of this as a column. So I'm just gonna take the conjugate, but the U and V are complex vectors. Those are spinners. And what we're gonna do is develop a set of basis spinners so we're going to uh, solve the matrix equation to find, or it's a four-dimensional space, so we're going to find an, a pseudo-orthonormal set of four basis spinners in which we can expand everything. So, so we're going to look for solutions for U's and V's with an eye to finding four independent, um, well, orthogonal. It turns out they're pseudo-orthogonal because our metric is H is indefinite, plus, plus, minus, minus. So they're gonna be pseudo orthogonal. And we just have to uh, forge ahead and see what happens. So the first step's not hard. Uh, when, when we act on this, what's gonna happen, right? We have I, D pulls down minus IP or plus IP. So um, let's see, how, how did I write this? Um, no, let me just write out two terms. Okay, so on this first one, 
we're going to pull down um, minus i p alpha. That's going to make this a plus. So we'll have u of p alpha and then p slash. So note the, the notation here, the simplification of the slash. This is, this is just p alpha contracted with a gamma alpha. And then we have uh, the Fourier mode again, p alpha x alpha. Um, let's see, minus m. Uh, how do I want to put the minus m? No, let me, let me write it. So this minus m acting on e to the minus i, p alpha x alpha. And then here we're going to get a minus sign and we'll have v conjugate of p. Uh, and again, we're going to have a p slash, uh, then it's still minus m. So I can write plus m here, e to the i p dot x, whereby p dot x, I, that's the four dimensional uh, space time inner product. And uh, this isn't so bad. We get, we get two equations here because these Fourier modes are independent of one another. So each coefficient has to vanish. So we get u p slash uh, minus, uh, I lost the u here. There's a u and a b. So let's write this as p slash minus m u equals zero. And um, then on the conjugate field, uh, it's still acting to the right. So p slash plus m v conjugate equals zero. So we get this pair of uh, matrix equations, right? So u and v are some spinners that have to satisfy that. And I just, uh, I'm just wondering why I haven't carried the conjugate through on v everywhere. I haven't, I'll have to check the notes there. Um, it seems to me I should be talking V conjugate if, if my original ansatz was right. And I think that is what I want, but we'll, we'll get there. So it's okay. not become clear to me why we need a conjugate or why the conjugate symbol makes any difference at all. Uh, I just assume that yeah. V is already. Fair, fair enough question. At this, at this point, it doesn't. Here's, here's what happens. Um, eventually, it's, this is going to turn into some Fourier modes like an A and an A dagger. And as we've seen in the antiparticles chapter, um, the dagger, uh, the dagger of, the, of the negative energy mode uh, creates an antiparticle. The undaggered thing on the positive energy mode annihilates a regular particle. You need that pairing. You need the creation of an antiparticle and the annihilation of a particle to come together and, and the conjugate of that whole thing in order to conserve charge uh, for starters, right? It, if the same field could create a particle and create an antiparticle, it's not conserving charge, right? So it's, it's got to create one and annihilate the other at the same time. And so, uh, at the same time, we're conjugating that field. We're, we're looking at the um, negative energy solutions. And, and we'll see this emerge as we go through. Those Vs will explicitly be negative energy solutions to the Dirac equation, which is interesting in itself because, I mean, Dirac did this whole thing to try to get a linear equation so you didn't have to worry about the negative energy modes, and yet they're still there. They don't go away just because you've made it a first order equation. Okay, so how do we solve this thing? Um, that's a matrix equation. It's not bad. It helps to actually put in our basis. So remember, gamma zero is one minus one and gamma i we're taking as uh, which way did the signs go? And here is the minus sigma i, sigma i. This is one possible out of a, an infinite continuum of uh, a GL4n class of possible 
GL4C. <laughs> uh, there are lots of these. Uh, but to write, say, this first equation, all right, I'm contracting the energy with gamma zero. So I have E and M is on the diagonal. So we have um, minus E minus M here because um, this hits the, the E. And then for the I components, we have P dot sigma here and minus P dot sigma there. And this acts on, okay, I've written this as uh, four two by two matrices. So what I'm gonna do for U, remember U is a four component spinner. So this is really four complex numbers, uh, A, B, C, D, um, where those are complex, but I can write it as two two component spinners. It's convenient to think of it that way as a, a device for solving these. So I have now two equations. Um, Do we have all the right signs in the bottom right entry? Are we missing a set of parentheses here? or anything? Yeah. Uh, it's a minus M times the identity here and uh, gamma zero is minus here. So I'm gonna check. Uh, and this is what I've written in the notes as well. I think I'm right. Okay. I think this is correct. So it's E minus M and minus E minus M. Okay. It yes, looks e minus weird. M and minus E minus M. All yeah. right, then. Yeah, that's right. So uh, now, let me tip this down so you can see it now, right? So we have E minus M uh, alpha plus P dot sigma acting on beta. So this is, this is a two by two matrix acting on a two component spinner. That's gonna be zero and then I can just get rid of all the minus signs here. So I have P dot sigma acting on alpha plus E plus M acting on beta equals zero. And <clears throat> now to, to take the next step, I have to be careful about the sign of the energy. All right, uh, I'm, I'm simply going to, uh, I'm going to look explicitly for positive energy solutions. And that, that will be the, the meaning of um, of U. So we're gonna let E be greater than zero uh, and consider solutions to this pair of equations. Now with E greater than zero, E plus M is, is non-zero. So I can divide by that and solve for beta is one over E plus M, uh, then P dot sigma acting on alpha. So I can solve for beta in terms of alpha. And now, now no word space. You see what happens with these, this black marker, but that's all right. So now I'm gonna substitute that into the top equation. So I have E minus M acting on alpha plus P dot sigma acting on another P dot, this is just a number. So P dot sigma squared over E plus M acting on alpha equals zero. And I can multiply by the E plus M so I get E squared minus M squared alpha so what's p dot sigma squared? You guys good with your poly matrices yet? Okay. Is it p dot sigma? Um, Sorry, say again. Uh, just the same as well. It must just be. Okay. The, the poly matrices, the product of two poly matrices, is delta i j plus i epsilon i j k. Sigma k. All right. You can get everywhere from there. They actually form a Clifford algebra. The anti commutator gives twice the delta because this anti symmetric part goes away. What we need here is pi sigma i uh, times pj sigma j, which is pi pj sigma i 
sigma j. That's symmetric in ij, which means that we only get the symmetric product of these. So I can write this as a half pi pj times the anti-commutator sigma i sigma j, which is twice Kronecker or delta ij, and the twos cancel, and we just get vector p squared. So that was quick. Any questions? Okay. All right. Good. So um, it's just p squared. And where was I? I'm lost here. That's p squared. I've multiplied by this e plus m. So I get a p squared alpha, which is e squared. Uh, wait, what's wrong? When you, uh, your second equation, when you solve for beta, shouldn't there have been a minus? That yes, yes, that's it. Yeah, minus. Whew, thank you. Minus, minus. Okay, so this says that E squared minus P squared minus, or let's call it P squared plus M squared alpha equals zero. We get the usual klein gordon energy equation. Right, we have to have E squared equals P squared plus M squared. Now, uh, in dealing, um, let's see, let's get those out of the way. Um, hunting for places to write things here. I'm, I'm gonna let, and I, I do this through the whole, this whole chapter. I'm gonna let omega be, defined as plus the square root p squared plus m squared. So sometimes I'll write plus e or sometimes minus e, but uh, if I write it in terms of omega, um, you know, e will be either plus omega or minus omega. H bar is one. So uh, for these solutions, e is omega. And now, Want to leave that till you've got it. Uh, we have um, this is the whole solution. So alpha alpha is anything alpha arbitrary. So we get two conditions and three conditions. Beta is minus uh, p dot sigma over. Uh, Let's, let's write it explicitly, omega plus m acting on alpha. So E is omega. And uh, this constitutes uh, a complete solution for U. Well, uh, oh, <laughs> sorry, thank you. Um, I could ask the same thing for you there. Here, Mo, I see, I see the top half of your head. <laughs> All right, it's nice to see your smiling face. Okay, all right, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. If you guys need to hide this, okay. All right, but this gives us a general solution for you, right? So we assumed positive energy. Um, we haven't looked for negative energy solutions. And in fact, for negative energy, uh, we can't, we can't guarantee that this isn't singular, right? If, if we have a particle at re, of negative energy at rest, you can't divide by E plus M because the energy is the mass and that diverges. So we can't solve for U if the energy is negative. We can solve for V though. So we'll get there in a second. Let's, let's look though first at um, the, the full solutions for U. So yeah, we'll have, we'll have to do V next time. So solving for you, uh, we, we have beta given in terms of alpha. Alpha can be anything, but there are only two independent choices, right? There, uh, alpha is some two component spinner. And remember, we're gonna be taking arbitrary linear combinations. We're looking for a, an orthonormal basis here. So let, 
alpha equal one zero or alpha equals zero one. That's enough to span the space, right? We're gonna take linear combinations of these two cases. So uh, if, if alpha is one zero, then beta is equal to, well, what's beta equal to? Uh, like all this stuff. Um, it's some two component spinner and we've got, uh, Oh, let's let's write this out. We need we need p dot sigma. So p dot sigma is equal to right poly matrices. You know, you guys just have them down like this, right? Uh, one day. So you have p z, p x minus i, p y, p x plus i. Py and minus bz. That's that's p up dotted into the poly matrices. So if I uh, if I construct this thing when alpha is one zero or zero one, I'm just going to get the first column or the second column. So so we have two cases. Uh, let's call it U1 is going to be, all right, we, we have one over E plus M here. I can pull that out. Then alpha is one, zero. Well, when it's one, let's put E plus, oh, sorry, wait, I'm doing this wrong. Um, just some answer, we'll, we'll normalize it in a minute. So we have one, zero, then when uh, when this acts on alpha, I'm going to get um, minus uh, p dot sigma. I'm going to get this first column, so minus p z, and it's over omega plus m. That's e plus m. And uh, then for the second component, I'm going to get I have a minus p x plus i p y over omega plus m. And that's our first basis vector, basis spinner. Um, we're going to want to normalize that. So, uh, what's the normalization? If I take um, u dagger h u, right? That's our inner product u with itself. That's going to change the sign of these two. So, what are we going to get? We're going to get a squared, then we have one plus zero plus, uh, and then this will be plus, we'll have PZ squared. Everything is over omega plus M squared uh, plus this times its conjugate. So let's see, so what do we have? Um, we have plus this, sorry. The conjugate with H is going to have plus, but u itself still has minus, so this becomes a minus. Then the conjugate, uh, this term is also minus, but we get this times its conjugate, so px squared plus py squared uh, becomes the normalization. So we need a squared. We have omega plus m squared down here, and the numerator. Uh, I can write this as omega squared plus two m omega plus m squared minus p squared. And uh, omega squared, I can write as p squared plus m squared. So the p squared is going to cancel. And I have a normalization that looks like two m omega plus m over omega plus m squared. So we lose one of those. So we have two m over omega plus m. So A is equal to um, square root of that, omega plus m over two m. Let me check that. Um, 
let's see, where, where is it? Omega plus m over two m square root. Yes, got it. And uh, now the only thing is, yeah, why are these positive? Did you uh, get that minus sign from the beta formula? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah, I'm wondering if I have a mistake in the notes on this. Um, minus sigma dot p alpha. It, yeah, it looks it looks like it looks like we maybe did it right here. Um, so uh, there's a there's a sign to check there. Um, because yeah, we, we needed that sign. And I, I think that was right from the original equation. That's, and that's, yeah, that's what I've got for beta. And it looks to me like I dropped it um, in my notes. So, so everybody check the sign. Uh, but, you know, basically this is right. Now there's, there's a U2. Gosh, sounds like a group, doesn't it? Um, where we pick up the second column. So the first column picked up the PZ and the PX plus IY. The second column is going to, the second one's going to pick up that. So uh, we're going to have something very similar for U2. Uh, I think the normalization works out the same. But now we're going to have zero and one. And uh, if the minus sign's right, I would say we need minus PX minus IPY over uh, omega plus M. And we're going to have plus PZ over omega plus M. But uh, once again, we'll, we have to check the signs. So uh, those are the positive energy solutions to the Dirac equation. For the negative energy solutions, we have to use V. And um, I challenge you all to do that on your own before Wednesday when we'll do it here. So uh, yeah, I stay with any questions. Uh, yeah, I'll check the signs and you know get, get them corrected in the notes. Uh, the notes are otherwise up to date, except for that, uh, what was it, page 131, the, the commutators in your problem. I got those wrong too. Uh, all right, so you guys will be lots better with signs than I am. So go forth and calculate, and uh, I'll see you guys on Wednesday, unless you uh, stay if you have questions. All right. Just got to see you. that just... last little bit behind you. Oh, 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 yeah, sorry. Uh, and down a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. So, yeah. So uh, easy enough to run through that matrix calculation again and check those signs. Um, but yeah, what what we got was a minus sign here, which which would lead to these uh, to these signs. And that's that's not quite what I have in the notes, but yeah, one of them is right. I hope one of them is right. I hope they're not both wrong. I don't think they're both wrong. Well, two two negatives makes a positive or whatever, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. There's bound to be one or the other of these expressions. I, I hope there's not some other mistake. But uh, anyway, uh, this is how you solve the Dirac equation, right? So we're going to find two negative uh, energy basis uh, basis spinners. So we'll have a complete basis. We're going to work up a whole bunch of identities with those basis spinners. Uh, you know, it's going to be it's going to be really useful for QED calculations, which you know I hope we get to pretty soon. Um, you know, we've got to quantize these guys too, and then we've got to do E and M, quantize E and M. Then we look at interactions, which is really where things get interesting. But uh, for the moment, this is plenty interesting. Uh, you know, solving the Dirac equation is actually pretty cool. Um, and, you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, plane wave modes, now you solve the matrix equation. 
Now we're gonna write the whole Dirac equation uh, solution to the Dirac, classical Dirac equation, free Dirac equation. Um, as a linear superposition of all four basis spinners and Fourier modes with arbitrary momentum dependent coefficients. So once again, it's, it's one of these big Fourier series, but you know, we've got this ex extra vector coming along. And E and M looks similar, except the, the vectors, instead of these four basis vectors, we're just gonna have two polarization vectors for, for the E and M field. Um, if you've looked at uh, wave solutions for light, you've seen those polarization vectors already. And if not, you'll see them in E and M next fall. So, <laughs> all right. Um, good, uh, questions? What can, I, uh, what can I answer for you guys? Anything? I'd like to check if the Hamiltonian I got is correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, shall I write down what you're reading me? Uh, well, I can just write the. In, this is in terms of the of the operators, so it's short. Um, oh, is okay. it a dagger a plus b dagger b. That's what I got. Obviously, oh, with a the dagger a plus b dagger b. Uh, yeah, yeah. It it sh it should be that, right? Um, a dagger okay. a, b dagger b. Those are number operators. Right. Yes. For, uh, you you define the fields the same way. The, the vacuum state is the state that's annihilated by all the A's and all the B's, and then you build up with A daggers. So normal ordering puts all the A's to the right, and uh, yes, you get A dagger A plus B dagger B, um, all times omega integrated d three k, is your Hamiltonian. Good. All right. Great. Yeah, so it's it's pretty much just what you'd think, right? Yeah, just it's the sum of the numbers of A's, the sum of the number of B's, um, each times their respective energies, h bar omega. Yeah, that's that's what I got. Just wanted yeah. to make sure. Good. And that's, uh, it. that's it. So, but but when I when you write the state of the of the field, would you because they're like both like separate kind of like mm. it, it's a Hamiltonian diagonalized. So I'm kind of thinking like, oh, this is the A state and the and kind of like the B state sort of. So yeah. would you would, would would you write them like that? Well, you you can have both, right? So you can ask for okay. a vacuum that's annihilated by all of the A's and all of the B's, and then build states by acting with arbitrary numbers of A daggers and B daggers. They all commute. So you can have a certain number of, you know. Uh, positive scalar field, scalar particles, and a s other number of uh, negatively charged um, scalar particles. Uh, let's see, these are, um, oh, let's see, what are these? Are these particles and antiparticles? Yeah, they would be. So, yeah, the, the B dagger creates an antiparticle, the A dagger creates a particle, but you can, you can have a space with a bunch of particles and art and particles, right? So you can have a state that that has various numbers of A's and B's of different values of K. Okay, so when I'm to show the vacuum state of each of the particles, do I start with a, an arbitrary, you know, basically a state with with an associated energy of A or of A particles or energy yeah, you, you see that? That's where I'm getting confused. Though. Okay, getting confused so you, you show that any any expectation value of the Hamiltonian is positive. It's non-negative, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you're sandwiching either an A dagger A or a B dagger B. That's positive definite, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, then you show that either acting, uh, you, you take some eigenstate of the Hamiltonian and act on it with A, and act on it with B and show that each of those lowers the energy. So, okay. so yeah. there's got to be a minimum for each of them. So there's some state that's annihilated by both of them. That's your back. Oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm getting I was just getting confused. Yeah, yeah. I I was I was trying to separate the no. no. It doesn't make sense because like it, we're thinking about eigenstates. 
Eigen yeah, states right. of the Hamiltonian itself. Yeah, that that's makes right. Sense. Yeah, so yeah, so you know we're going to create states that have some antiparticles and some particles. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. I, that was that was literally it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah, you headed off, Kevin. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. I'll I'll see you guys soon then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Alex. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Be in touch about the the transcribing notes stuff. Yeah, okay. Just, yeah, I'll talk to you uh, after class. Let me know how it all goes. All Sounds right. Sounds good. I'll Thanks see you later. Later. Bye. Bye.